My first guest for the show is Fred Kent. He is the founder and pioneer of placemaking movement for 50 years. He is also the founder of the Earth Day New York. He alongside with his friends founded Project for Public Spaces and grew PPS and placemaking into a global agenda. He has done amazing works and now working on two initiatives, the Social Life Project and Placemaking X. You can read his amazing articles and insights on the website the Social Life Project. In this episode, we talked about his journey of placemaking and various initiatives and how did it all happen. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. I am Azban Sari, the founder of the organization Peacemakers Pakistani. And I am bringing you the stories of placemakers, artists and professionals from around the globe about how they created an impact and made change happen. You are listening to the Making It Happen show. Thank you for joining in. Enjoy the episode. Hi. 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 Ah, a face to the name. Hello, <laughs> Fred. Welcome to Hi. the show. Yeah. I'm so excited to have you as my first guest and thank you for joining me. Well, I'm I'm very honored, and I, we've been following your amazingly wonderful work. Thank you. You are a star <laughs> in Thank the you. world of placemaking. I don't mean that to go to your head, but it's true, <laughs> and it's fun, isn't it? I mean, it's so easy in a way uh, to do it because it's so natural. Uh, yeah. It's not a, it's not in the mind; it's more in the heart. Exactly. Yes. It's in the heart. Uh, and uh, the mind helps to put it forward. Yeah. Right. No, it's exactly right. Yeah. It's yeah. sort of like uh, you're on a track and you got to keep going. Yes. And uh, it's fun going on this track. Yeah. Yeah. And the people you meet and the places you visit and the life you live and, you know, it's infectious for, for everyone. So. Yeah, I would like to mention here that uh, you just uh, turned 75 this year in this November and uh, I was just staring at your smile, the generous smile. It's so infectious and I aspire to have it as I get old. So yeah, it's yeah. just so cool that you have completed 75 years and of your life and 50 years of placemaking. Well, I'm the same age as our new president. Wow. So in a way, you know, we may be going back to, uh, you know, wisdom or our uh, intuition or, you know, common sense. Uh, you know, you, you don't, you can't sell a bad idea for a lot of years. Yes. <laughs> you, know, you have to you have to give the gift to people to understand it uh, for themselves is basically what this is all about. Yes. And my audience, I would suggest to go watch uh, Urban Estica podcast episode of Fred Ken with Mustafa Sharif. It was very detailed and very briefly explained how it, uh, the pacemaking movement came into being from Project for Public Spaces. All right. Uh, okay. So, Fred. How did you come up with the term placemaking and why was there a need for this terminology? You already had project public spaces, you know. So I wanted to ask you, why was there a need for terminology? Because public spaces have a sort of a static term. You know, it may be an existing park, an existing street, an existing uh, plaza, whatever it is. And uh, it, it just didn't seem like anything could really happen. It was, you know, we're going to build a public space. But when you turn the, it into an active word, into action, you change the whole, it, it's the paradigm shift. Because now you're never finished and placemaking is an ongoing process that, in, that engages and envelops everyone in any space that they're in. Uh, private spaces, public spaces, you know, it's, it starts to kind of uh, infiltrate the way you design a building. You know, you open up a building and have the uses inside and outside, and that's that's a that's placemaking. Uh, so private owning 
is 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 a is a term that uh, the community needs to own everything in a way, uh, even the private privately owned spaces, because if they're just private sort of walled off uh, places, they they don't do anything for the community. So it's really a, a much more engaging and uh, and collaborative process between. Uh, the community and and uh, the developers or the city, uh, and it's not an adversarial one. It's really a you know it's sort of understanding the the two forces and needs. So you're not uh, ending up with something that's static. And- uh, I would like to mention here that um, I was doing my thesis project on public spaces, and I was very badly stuck at one point. And then I've discovered this word place making. And my all of my gatherings, my findings, and the solutions were given a title, and it became easier for me to present my thesis, and it got approved all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. So yeah no. This term yeah. brings the information in a focused way. So yeah, it's good that it has been done actually. Yeah, it changes the whole dynamic, and you know, it puts placemaking not really as an academic, uh, as an action, as a doing, as a making, as peacemaking, <laughs> you know, all of those things, they all go together. You know, democracy, local democracy, community ownership, governance, they all are, are woven together and, uh, and the outcomes are beyond anyone's imagination because they're somehow a collection of wisdom and ex- ex- and experiments that uh, come out. And, you know, one of the terms that I loved, we, uh, we came up with is, uh, uh, we're always looking for what we call zealous nuts. Uh, people who, who don't know what they can't do, you see. And a lot of people who aren't educated are actually better off because they don't know what they can't do. You know what I mean? When you get educated, all of a sudden you're put into a box and you're required to perform for that particular discipline. Uh, And you have rules and regulations and you have uh, awards and so on and so forth. And uh, so the people who are on the edge or getting out of their discipline become the change agents. Uh, But it's still very tough because, you know, we have so many different disciplines and they all are, are, are very good. I mean, it's not that they're bad. And people have really gotten deep into many issues, environmental issues especially. Uh, you know, we've got knowledge about every single aspect of the environment that you can imagine. But we're not making the environment a lot better. So the idea of place, place governance, you know, really has, and, and local ownership and participation and you know the word democracy is is not a political word. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a word that just represents people working together. Uh, and it's you know when you start politicizing it, you start losing it, and you get the separation. But but democracy is a wonderful word for uh, local engagement and ownership and and uh, isolating. Yes. All right. Actually. Uh- all right. Okay. And explain with this sentence that spaces that invite people in rather than design them out. What are those kind of spaces? So can you say that again? Yes. Spaces that invite people in rather than oh, okay. design them out. What is meant by that? Well, uh, when you're looking for the social life of a space, then you're looking at not what it looks like, you're looking at how people use it. And uh, I just love what we were doing uh, last year. In the last year, we started slowing down and we started looking at places a little bit more closely. And there's one we looked at, there's a couple. Well, one, I love the one on the, uh, that we did on the, on the bollard, that, uh, you know, the bollard, that, uh, the Paris bollard, uh, I don't know if you saw that. It's a wonderful ex- example of where this simple bollard actually becomes a social gathering place. 
and people standing at the intersection actually hang on to the bollard. They stand around it, you know, and they, and then when they're not, at, it's not right at the intersection, they, they do other things. So they talk and they have our conversations and the bollard is kind of a place to, to, to have as a cover. Uh, so, you know, that was never what it was intended for, but because it was uh, done and, and for reasons that other people started to adapt it to their need, which is phenomenal. And so that's a, that's an example. And then there's another one of this silly bench with a, a ring around a tree and uh, people, the, the, the uh, vendors come out and put a board on it. And uh, so all of a sudden it becomes the space between two vendors that helps both of them come alive. You know, so those are just, the, how, what did that take? That was not, you didn't hire a designer to come in and do it. It was done, it, it was an improvisation of, of the best kind. And, uh, and you really can learn from that. I mean, that's just a, a step to the, to the next level where someone who is observing like we are, you are, you know, can help people to do that. Uh, so that's improvisation, which is really, I love the term improvisation. Can I explain that a little more? Yeah, sure, you can. Because <laughs> we had someone on our staff at PPS uh, said uh, architecture is frozen music, planning is composition, and so and uh, placemaking is improvisational street performance, which is amazing. I mean that puts everyone in their own silo in a way. So all of a sudden in November I turned that upside down, and I said. You know, improvisation is community engagement and, and involvement. And uh, planning is visioning. And architecture is happy music. So it immediately lined up the progression that we're all looking for. Uh, that, uh, you know, we want the community to becoming the leaders. And we want the professionals and the uh, designers and people to implement it to, to do that. Back to that, what it does is the uh, previous thing about uh, architecture, frozen music and planning uh, composition, you know, it turns it upside down. When you do that, you're really getting it into, into the, the way you want it to become and the way it should become. It's not going against anyone. All the disciplines can add, can be part of that. But it really starts with that key ingredient is a local improvisation ownership and, and ends up with that and also at the end because you're not, you, we also have a phrase is you're never finished. And if you think you have to, you're wrong uh, because then you've locked it in and locking it in is a, really a bad deal because so much of architecture is locked in and, and, and uh, impenetrable. And it's that impenetration that just creates uh, walls and barriers and isolation uh, that we can't afford to have. Exactly. I'm um, being an architect. I know that. Right. But you see, the real issue, what we're trying to do is we're turning everything upside down. Yeah. You see, and if you say that that's what you want to do, then people say, uh-oh, uh, or they don't want it, or they begin to see what that means. And then they begin to see what it's like on the other side. So they can begin to say, huh, well, maybe I could go there and maybe I will do better work or I may enjoy it more. I may be more part of the community. So otherwise, you're just uh, you're you're creating these uh, disciplines that don't want to talk to each other because they're not talking any language that they understand. So, you know, getting beyond their discipline is really a critical part of solution to the world's problems, actually, frankly, uh, whether you're in the medical business or you're in the uh, environmental business or in the design or community businesses, all those people that are siloed in their disciplines are really, they, we, we have a phrase as each discipline has become its own audience. You see, so they generate their own agendas, they have their own requirements and so on. And then you begin to realize that they've isolated themselves from the real client, which is they themselves and the communities they're serving. So, you know, it's really a, a kind of a, a revolution that we're talking about that really is, it's an organic one, natural. It's not a, it's not a uh, ideological 
uh, idea at all. It's a simple common sense uh, agenda that, you know, really people can't argue with once they get involved. And uh, it frees people up enormously uh, to do much better work. Yes. And I think that's the heart of the placemaking movement. I really do. I think it's freed people up like yourself to do something way beyond what you thought you could do. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what's so, so simple and powerful. Okay, so you said in our placemaking leadership council in Detroit in 2013 that everyone has the right to live in a great place. More importantly, everyone has the right to contribute to making the place where they already live great. I want to ask you how you convince people to say they are power in this perspective. Like we human live in certain patterns and we get used to it. And then we have, we can't, we think that we can't manage life out of our routine. So tell me your struggle about how you convince people to find the strength and opportunities in areas where they are, are already living and to turn their place upside down and their mindset as well. Well, I, you know, thinking about that, quote i mean 2013 my mind has changed a lot actually oh, and really? i'm now saying it's not everyone has a right they have an obligation because if they don't you're not going to get what you need uh, you know it's like it becomes a natural way you live in a community is doing that it's it's not uh it's not the right it's the obligation so I would turn those words into stronger words, but not necessarily uh, demanding words. I would say that it's sort of like it's part of your way you live uh, rather than the right. It's a, it's, it's a natural way where you, uh, come, you naturally respect people and you respect what they do and you uh, work with them to have these things happen. So... You know, it's out of the isolation and, and, and uh, self and grand, grand, uh, self, uh, what is it, self aggrandulation or something. There's some word there that, self you know, self, yeah, so, you know, how you, you, you know, it's all about yourself. Self well, regulation. Not, yeah, right. So when it's not yourself, just yourself, you, you know, you feel better and you actually can perform uh, much better. And you're, it's not your, what you did, it's what we did. So, you know, we never, we, ne we don't, we can't get an award for what we do. That's not possible. We did get an award, but it wasn't for what we did. It's just how placemaking became something important, but, you know, which is okay. But, it, but I would never accept an award for something, a, a, a big project like what we did in Detroit or New York or other places. Yeah. I guess your biggest reward is the impact you are creating. Yeah, and I think when people, you know, when people realize that it's really about the impact, uh, then, you know, then these awards become more something else. I, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but I don't really think of them as very important anymore. Yeah. Okay. So you say public spaces can foster stronger communities. How do you define strong communities, and why do we need them? Well, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're not uh, sort of naturally proactive uh, in your community, in your, even kids in the school, you know, they can be doing things. You know, schools should not be isolated. They should be places of, of discovery and, and thinking about how they might serve I mean, there's no place that should be isolated and separated out as a non-participant uh, in a community. It should be part of everyone's life. And, uh, you know, and I, and I really believe that that, that was the way uh, the life occurred prior to, uh, you know, there's the historic communities, historic villages, uh, whatever culture you're in, you know, they were places where the, the gathering was a key part. The social gathering was a key part of their lives. And the places devolved from those needs naturally uh, that people, you know, and we've, worked, we've done a lot of work in Saudi Arabia and they were a tribal country. Uh, and they, they, you go look at the historic communities in Saudi Arabia and they're all around squares and public spaces and, you know, and they're, they're, we're done 
organically uh, and shared, you know, in the community. You know, when people get ownership and they start to control, then there gets to be some, you know, some separation. But if that process is, is supported and allowed, you get a level of excellence that uh, you can't get when people take on, quote, too much power. I mean, we're working in Saudi Arabia and they really like placemaking because it is about their communities. It isn't, you know, they don't see the top down as being successful. Uh, and even in their 2030 plan, they've used the word placemaking as a way to, to build their communities around their local the local people and different cultures too. So you introduced the phrase lighter, quicker and cheaper in 2010. Share some examples or experiments that you saw happening as quick wins, which brought attention to larger projects with lasting transformative change. Yeah, no, this is, this was revolutionary and it's so simple because everyone wants to do a master plan. And in fact, the, the work we did in Detroit, they called us and said, we want you to be part of a master plan to redo the downtown of Detroit. And I said, we don't do master plans. Uh, they forced me to come. And in one month, we persuaded them that they needed a placemaking vision, an activation plan. And they went and did it. And uh, we did the plan in, in December and they implemented, they announced it in the beginning of April and they implemented a good part of it by June. So, and then what they realized, uh, they used, they started realizing that D Detroit was probably one of the worst, in one of the worst situations of any city in the world that had been basically vacated. And this guy had come in and bought some buildings and uh, he was a, uh, a, 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 a loan, he, he, he did real estate loans. Uh, and developed a big company uh, called Quicken Loans. And we were in a meeting and I called him a zealous nut. Uh, and, the, and he, you know, sort of sat back and I said, well, what I mean is that you, you have to be someone who doesn't know what you can't do. You know, and then I said lighter, quicker, cheaper. And that became his mantra. So he would do things, see how they work and then go on and do something else. So he was really activating the public spaces to build value for people and, and, and uh, real estate in the community. And it changed it fundamentally. It was what happened. If they'd done a master plan, they'd still be looking at what they had to do rather than what they could do. And so lighter, quicker, cheaper got away from the master planning people. You know, they couldn't do a master plan uh, after that. They did one, but I don't, but they've never looked at it since then. And so they just keep revitalizing, revising the activation plan, placemaking activation plan. And you keep going through, you might go through a number of them. And eventually you, you implement enough to know what you really need to do. So it's like a shortcut to getting a product and outcomes. Yes. Why, well, you know, it's the social life. You could almost say it's the social life, stupid. It's the sidewalks and the social life. And that's where you start. And, but, you know, there's still this real need to do big projects. And, um, and, but then again, you can do things by starting with even stage sets, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and starting to create environments that then become destinations as you build those, that community or that new town or whatever it is. Uh, and then you build around it and support it. So that you're really going back to history and how uh, communities were naturally laid out and created in every culture, in every culture, you know, it was, it, it, it has not been different. If you take the American Indian and the, and the, the communities they built uh, to the Saudis and the nomads, and I don't know enough about Pakistan, but, you know, it was, you know, it was, it was a beautiful process with great, great uh, returns. And, and, uh, and looking back at that history, it's, it's the, it's the way forward. We yeah. can't. We can't do these uh, inhumane projects. They they don't. They they should not survive. They will not. So I read an article that says that you had helped in setting up the world's first downtown management organization. Explain right. me what is meant by downtown management organization and why public space management is a limiting factor for cities. Well, uh, 
95% of the success of a public space is how it's managed. So if you set up an organization to manage the public spaces, you're actually setting up an organization to manage and design and program those public spaces. And design actually becomes infinitely more important when you're managing something because it's always changing. And so you need far more skills when you're managing something. You need, uh, you know, you need all kinds of graphic skills, all kinds of skills, landscape, everything, because you're now doing a management and the management isn't defined by the discipline, it's defined by the uses and how the uses can come alive. And so it's uh, enormously skill-based uh, and, and improvisationally based, uh, you know, with, with professionals, but also with people in the community. So it's sort of like a, a, an iterative partnership that can only uh, uh, survive if, uh, if, if it becomes, uh, pre, uh, you know, uh, it becomes messy. <laughs> so to speak, yeah. you know, then you get your results because you're going to learn about it. Yes. Okay. And uh, tell me your experience of working and exploring public spaces with your wife, Kathy Madden. Uh, what difference did it make to see the world from your perspective as man <laughs> and listen to pay attention as a woman perspective at the same time because you were working together? Uh, share your experience because we can't have her oh, here. That's, <laughs> that's easy. Uh, she is a designer. She was trained as a designer, but she grew up in a hotel okay. in the bottom of a hotel on the banks of the Mississippi River. So she never saw design as an object. She always saw design as people, whether people were comfortable in using it. So she will go into any public space and she'll look at it and immediately see the faults of it. So she wasn't you know, she wasn't co-opted by a design profession. She, uh, she uh, made design work for her based on her, how she grew up. And so uh, we were always aligned and um, her, she taught me so much and I just happened to be more of a spokesperson than I am uh, and she really has the kind of intuition. We'll go into a hotel room and she'll move some of the furniture. Uh, we went into one hotel and we moved the furniture in, the, in our room out into the hall because it wasn't working. And, you know, her first thing is to look and see where things are, whether they're placed right or not. So that it's really, it's, it's about, it's really the ultimate in design of a, of a place because it's really thinking about the human uses first. And so uh, she's a she's a remarkable remarkable person. Uh, whether it's a woman, maybe it is a woman. I mean, maybe that is more what a woman would do is arrange things, you know. Uh, but she was thinking of she was using it on a lot much larger scale. Yeah, she did great. <laughs> okay, so share your experience of working so, with. You know, yeah. So we're, you know, we're, it's a, it's a really wonderful partnership. It isn't like, uh, you know, you never, you, you might have some d discussions and some disagreement, but you, in the end, you, you begin to see. And uh, so it's very comfortable and very natural. And yes, and uh, experiencing it all the time together. That's another thing. Yeah. That's another yeah, fun 40, life. <laughs> fun life. Yeah. Oh, it is for 40 years. Right. Great. I mean, we've taken probably seven or 800,000 images and we were now going back and looking at them. And when you see them fresh, you begin to see things you didn't see when you were there just taking a bunch of pictures. Yeah. So it's been a revelation for us. And that's where we came up with the sidewalks. You know, you began to realize we're, we're not looking at the street. We're looking at the social life on the sidewalk. That's what's important. So we put that out. Now we'll do that with our, about architecture. We'll do it about public buildings. Uh, Fred, share your experience of working with William Holly White as the company we keep greatly impacts our dreams and the way we see things and the way we act upon our values and principles. Well, you know, I worked with him and uh, I did a uh, study of the day in the life of a wastebasket on an intersection in, uh, in Manhattan here. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I, I did a lot of observations working with him. Uh, and uh, I just never stopped looking. 
you know, it became so interesting. You sort of didn't have to, uh, you, you didn't pride yourself in your intellectual knowledge. You pride yourself in your observational knowledge and what you saw. And so it was very easy to just keep doing that. And we did it for 40 years, but we didn't really look carefully enough at what we saw and found until after we left PPS and started the Social Life Project. And then all these things started to reveal themselves, you know, like that silly bench with the thing around the tree and the bollard. And we have lots of those things. We have all kinds of things. The seating was a big one too. You know, how people use seating in different places, in different settings. So we have so much information that we'll put out in these little stories that will help people. And that goes back to something really, really important. I don't believe you can write big, long articles. and No one's going to read them, except for people who are in the professional world. But if you show, you know, a, a series of images and a little bit of text, you're doing what Holly White taught me is when he started doing movies, he um, was really interesting. He would set up the movie so he would tell you what you were going to see, show you what happened, and then tell you what you saw. So he was never telling you what was going on. He was showing you what was going on, but helping you to see it. And so that's why we do these images with very, these posts with very powerful images. The images are incredibly powerful. And we learned over the 40 years what to look for to take those images. You know, it's a, it's a real special way of doing it. You know, you're always looking for that moment when someone is doing something that then people will say, oh, wow, I see it. You know, so you're setting up the, the experience for people to see something and then you're maybe telling them a little bit what they saw and they don't remember you. They don't remember it was you that did it, which is what you really want. It's they it got into their brain and they see it and they go, ha ha, and they're, and they're changed forever. And they never know how it happened which is exactly the way you want it to be, without any question. Then you have, you have given people a light that they haven't seen before. They know it, they all know it, but they just haven't seen it. And so it's, people are naturally, uh, placemakers are naturally uh, tuned into this, but they've never been allowed to really uh, look at it that carefully. So it's a revelation for people, and it's very simple. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Basically, Holly White taught you how to look at things and yeah. how to just, just observe them, like a mentor does that. Yeah, right. That. It's, you can see a lot just by observing, yeah. is a phrase. Okay, so what is the difference between your practice, that is placemaking, and the work being done by Jan Gill? Well, Jan, they're professionals and they're, they're focused on public space and the life between buildings and, and stuff like that. They're still been, uh, I'm going to use a word I don't like, but co-opted by the professional community. And uh, we're community organizers. You see, there's a big, big difference between a community organizer and a professional that comes in and delivers a product because we're always looking for those nuances that make whatever it is work and the process is a lighter quicker cheaper process uh, rather than a master plan uh, so you can cover you you can get started right away but when you start doing the master plan you start going into the professions and the, what the professions offer and uh, that's where you lose. Uh, I was just looking at a master plan done by very good people in Brisbane, Australia, and it's not going to be very good. Uh, you know, it's got the right things, but in the end, there's a lot more that needs to go on. The power of 10 is a big idea. You know, it's 10 places with 10 things to do in each of those places. Well, that's not a design solution. It's a programming solution. So, you you know, you start bringing in more of the, less the design uh, and planning, and you bring in more of the programming and uh, management and governance 
issues into it. And then that drives your outcome. It's like improvisation, you know, it's, it's how that works. So you can immediately see where people failed. And, 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 you know, one of the problems we had with PPS is that there were professionals that came in and they wanted to provide their professional work, which uh, we would keep fighting. But so the leadership at PPS all left and we're now running Placemaking X and the Social Life Project. So we have people who really are free of that professional overlay that, you know, that they fall, that they, they're trapped in. Oh, here we go with our wrap up set questions. Um, so Fred, what drives you? What keeps you focused on public spaces? Oh, well, there's nothing more fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we're here in, in Brooklyn and we go out every day and sit on our stoop and watch the life go by. You know, I mean, why, what's, it's so interesting. And you see the people you like, you know, your grandchildren come over, you know, it's sort of the life of the community. Uh, so uh, that's much more fun than watching the news <laughs> or, you know, you know, so it's, 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 it's easy. Yes. And I think a lot of people do it, you know, you know, they go and sit at the, the street corner cafe, they eat in the outdoor cafe, you know, the, it's, it's the life of so many people. Uh, and probably the less people, the less, I, this is not a good thing to say, but the less uh, professional they are, you know, because when you're a profession, you have to keep doing your profession. But, you know, they're probably get more out of just being out there. They don't realize how much they see, but they see a lot. And uh, that's, it's, it's something, it's actually a, a bit of jealousy. You know, if you have to work all the time in an office, you're, you're cut off from reality. Okay, and share any experience or memory that made you feel that you made a right decision to be a placemaker or work for public spaces and its people. Well, when I was in graduate school in geography, I, uh, would take these long trips down into the South, South America or Africa or somewhere. And uh, I just, you know, I keep remembering almost step by step, every step I took in some places. I have such a vivid memory of that experience. And just, I get thrilled remembering it. And I have some pictures of them. You know, there was one, uh, plaza down in uh, Quito, Ecuador. And uh, wow, I just remember these people, the, the local Indian culture, uh, using it very different than the local Spanish culture, but they were both sort of appreciating it. And so I have these pictures of people, you know, sort of watching the more uh, open naturally uh, use of uh, of the indian cultures who would come in and markets and so on and so it just sort of indelibly put in my mind the kind of appreciation for 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 it and uh, you just oh there was one oh it was so funny there was one where there were these uh three men old men sitting on a bench and uh, on the next bench across the walkway were these four kids sitting. And I have a picture. I haven't put this one up, but I will sometime. So one of the kids moved over to where the men were, the old men were. So if you have the two, you realize that here are the kids sitting and here are the old men sitting. And here's a little kid that's going over to see what it's like to be an old man. You know, it was sort of like it created this kind of, uh, I don't know, something that I never forgot. It was fun to remember that. When we, ob uh, when we observe public spaces, we just can't stop imagining what is happening. It's a story going on in our own mind. Yeah, it makes you a storyteller, of course, if you have just yeah. observed the spaces around you. Yeah, you, you, you lose yourself in these, you know, you become, you become much less important than you think you are, which is also very healthy. Yes. Okay. Share your hardest moment of work life where you actually felt that it's the struggling moment. Well, when we were, we had this sort of, uh, someone tried to take over PPS 
uh, because they wanted us to become a professional planning organization. And uh, we were, uh, that was, we didn't realize how much we didn't want to do that until they forced us out. And so we did what we call a hard fork where the leadership of PPS moved out. And then we set up the Social Life Project, the Placemaking Fund and uh, Placemaking X. So it was a hard, it was hard, but it was in the end, it was, we couldn't have done what we're doing now if we had to stay at PPS. And then the question is, will PPS survive? And I, I don't really have an answer to that, but it's, but it's, you see, everything was going on around the world that where people were taking this idea on, you know, it wasn't our idea, it was everyone's idea. So how could we, you know, run or control or manage or do something like that? It had to be a network, it was clear. So we're all in the same boat. We all respect each other and we're all trying to do something and we share things and we discover things from each other. And, you know, what's more fun than that? I don't know. Yes. There's always a silver lining. Okay, so one quote or favorite quote of place making mantra of yours. Well, Your I, I, well I like a, a very wise friend of mine said, each discipline has become its own audience. And so that has always kind of rung true in my head. And uh, I, I love that idea. And it sort of puts people apart from who they really are. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, changing that is really tough. I mean, these, li these professionals line up to combat you, to discredit you, to, you know, they don't want you to take over their work. And what happened to us here in New York is that we did these really uh, key projects at Times Square and Bryant Park and Rockefeller Center and some others, a lot of them. And then the professionals came in and they are, they have not created the same atmosphere that we did organically and naturally that we didn't really realize how different it is. Now things are all design led and professionals give awards and we're not doing uh, here in in New York, uh, and uh, we're going to do some articles saying that uh, that New York has lost its soul. Uh, about that. All right. So, share your opinion about Pakistan or place speaking in Pakistan. Well, I've never been there. Okay. So, but I I probably would love the kind of older, more local areas uh and not the built-up areas but you know that's probably would be you know that's where i would gravitate towards okay, so what do you want to know about pakistan which areas local areas i want to come, I want to come there <laughs> i don't want to know i want to come oh, okay. you can't know you can only experience <laughs> yeah i will have you here yeah right. okay any message for global readers out there as many young professionals are joining in well, it's uh, the, the old way of doing things clearly isn't working. And uh, the new way is not the new way. It's going back to the historical, natural way. Uh, so we're going back to the future in a way and getting back to the roots of our need for social interaction and local e economic and all the things that just make our lives full. And we're, we lost that for a while. And this COVID has woken us up to that, I think, more than anything else. I mean, what happened in New York with cafes just blossomed all over the place. They're not great yet, but they're, you know, there's a whole culture around that when you go back to, to Istanbul or to, you know, wherever in the in that world that you're in, where you, you have sort of these historic areas that are just full of life. And I've been to India and I just loved every minute I was in these towns and villages and markets and in India, it was just, it was my life. I loved it. So I, you know, I'm kind of ignorant of that, but boy, do I re relate to it very strongly. Great. Uh, thank you so much for this episode, Fred. It was lovely talking to you and it was an awesome experience learning from you. Keep doing the work. And I'm looking forward to more articles on Social Life Project. Thank you for this episode. Thank you for being here.